<clears throat> Hi everyone, thanks for joining uh, today. As uh, you may or may not know, uh, the team at the lab has been producing uh, these category disruption reports focused on what is happening now under coronavirus and what the world might look like after coronavirus. So these reports are looking mostly beyond the media space um, at going industry by industry, vertical by vertical, uh, thinking through how consumer behaviors are changing and how they're affecting our clients' businesses and what we can do to help. So uh, this report is um, focused on entertainment and media, but we have a whole variety of them for every industry. All of this content is available uh, for customization for your clients. Uh, so just uh, reach out and ask a member of the lab team about that. Um, and uh, this is recorded and will be available for you to share with anybody internally um, for use uh, with inside the agency network. Um, so before I start, I just want to call out that there is a Q&A function available inside of Teams. So if you have a question, uh, just type it into the Q&A section. Uh, ben, who is helping me produce this, uh, this presentation, he will see it. I will stop at the end of each section and Ben will uh, read any, any questions that arise during the, the course of that section. All right. All right. So uh, again, thanks for joining. Um, in general, at a very high level, we have been seeing uh, the pandemic mostly as a trend accelerator across industries. Looking at trends that otherwise might have taken three to five years to manifest themselves as mainstream consumer trends, a lot of those trends are getting pulled forward um, and they're happening very quickly. Uh, this is probably most apparent in the entertainment and media space because of course, uh, it has really shifted uh, the focus of the entire entertainment industry on reaching people in their homes. So first, I'm going to jump through some stats in the media space and, and look at media consumption and how it's been changing um, under coronavirus. Uh, the first one, and this is obvious, pretty obvious for everybody, is that uh, a lot of us are at home. 90% uh, of, uh, of U.S. adults have been asked to stay home. Uh, the numbers in terms of uh, how many people are working from home versus uh, sheltering at home and, and maybe unemployed or not working, uh, those numbers are kind of all over the place. The best estimate I've seen is that between 30 and 40 percent of Americans are at home, still working, um, and third might be at home but unemployed. But obviously, this has shifted our um, our media consumption behaviors. The other angle is that it's not obviously just adults who are home, it's also children. Um, there are 32.5 million children home from school, and uh, some of those kids, uh, their parents are also home working uh, and need to find uh, distractions for them and hopefully somewhat educationally, ed educational distractions, but uh, you know something for them to do so that they can continue working. Some of those kids are at home while their parents are on the front lines as essential workers, um, but regardless, uh, schools pretty much everywhere around the country have been closed, um, and so there's a ton, a huge uptick in media time for, for children specifically. Now, I'm going to go through uh, two stats on, on video consumption. Uh, the first one is linear television. Now, this is from Magna, and these percentages are looking at individual days year over year, um, and it's the year over year change. So as you can see at, at the end of February, beginning of March, um, the it was down in a, the 15 ish percent range. This is pretty typical linear TV use, usage and consumption has been dropping about 15 percent year over year for a while now. <clears throat> so that's pretty normal. And as started to be instituted um, and people started staying home that uh, that actually flipped and went, it went into uh, an increase. So people started watching more linear television. Um, and that, as you can see, that's somewhere in the 10 to 12 percent range uh, in general. Um, so ob obviously more uh, an increase in consumption. This wasn't necessarily obvious at the time because we know a lot of linear TV consumption is around live sports. I um, mean, we'll get to sports uh, and what's happening with sports in a bit, but with no sports on the air, we weren't really sure if people would increase their linear TV viewing. It turns out that they actually are. Um, so, you know, that's good news for cable companies and broadcast networks, uh, but I think you can guess what's coming. Um, which is that streaming usage is even higher. Um, these numbers, as you can see, we're, we're in the 20 to 25 percent range year over year growth uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the end of February, beginning of March. That went up to the 80 and 90 percent uh, in March and April. 
Um, and depending on the demographics, this is for this is overall usage for all consumers. Depending on the demographics, for a lot of demographics, streaming usage is up even more. It's over 100% in the 125 per, 125% range, uh, and that is uh, driving um, incredible growth. Um, it, it's not evenly distributed, of course. Um, the biggest beneficiary uh, from uh, from the increase in streaming has been Disney Plus. Um, as you might have seen, Disney Plus recently reached 50 million subscribers worldwide um, on the back of this pandemic and lockdown. Again, lots of parents probably see Disney Plus as an easy way to keep their kids entertained while they are at home. Um, but across the board, everybody, everybody is up. Um, Amazon Prime is up 144%. Netflix is up 134%. Hulu is up 129%. Um, Disney Plus was up 141%, and YouTube was up 111%. That those are all those percentages are all in terms of uh, minutes consumed year over year. So a big boost for for everybody. Um, and we have seen uh, an increase in some new subscribers to streaming services, especially the long tail, um, especially outside of Amazon, Netflix, and Hulu. Uh, again, the biggest beneficiary there was Disney Plus, um, but we are seeing a boost pretty much across the board for smaller players including Apple TV Plus and CBS All Access as well. So what are people watching? Um, well, 29% of users are re-watching content they've already seen before. Um, we see this as uh, looking for comfort food television. Uh, a lot of the, these re-watches are either for uh, classic sitcoms, uh, obviously people looking for light-hearted light entertainment, or for genre television, um, fantasy, sci-fi, horror, uh, things that, uh, certain demographics are attracted to and that you know are serve more than just uh, a content style, but also it sort of across the line over and in, into hobby. Um, and the other interesting stat here is that 16% of adults are watching scripted content about pandemics. So maybe looking to uh, Hollywood to either um, you know, ease their fears or to uh, help them experience some sense of catharsis as they see uh, characters in a scripted drama go through the same things that we're going through right now. <clears throat> so it's an interesting time for this to be happening, of course, uh, in, in the, the streaming space because um, we have uh, a couple of a few launches that either have just happened or are about to happen. Um, the first one was Quibi, which uh, launched last week as we're, as we're recording this. Um, and Quibi uh, Quibi launched with uh, 1.75 million downloads in their first week. So Quibi, just in case people are not familiar, um, is Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg's uh, mobile only streaming service, uh, mobile premium content streaming service. So they have uh, Hollywood produced movies and TV shows chopped up into quick bites of 10 to 15, uh, seven to 10 minutes uh, that are designed to be consumed on the go. Um, of course, no one is going anywhere right now. so. Uh, the value proposition might be a little different. Um, that 1.75 million downloads number is pretty good for anybody who is not called Disney. Um, that's a pretty good showing for a new app and a new brand. Uh, what we don't know, of course, is retention. Um, they didn't release any numbers on, on the number of minutes consumed by the average user. They didn't call out any specific show as uh, consuming a lot of attention, uh, which tells us that there probably wasn't a breakout show in their first wave of releases. Uh, and the big question is, will people continue to pay for Quibi beyond the 90 day trial? They did extend their, their original trial offer to 90 days, which uh, you know, hopefully gets us beyond lockdown. Um, and maybe gives people a chance to experience Quibi um, in the way that it was meant to be experienced. Um, but there's, a, again, solid showing for downloads, but there's still a lot of questions uh, around Quibi. It's still a bit of an unknown. Um, I think as we get closer to that 90 day window, we'll, we'll start to have a better idea um, because I think it'll be pretty obvious from social listening if people are watching Quibi and talking about their shows. <clears throat> Next up is Peacock, which um, as we record this on April 15th, is actually rolling out today for Comcast subscribers. Um, it will be coming to uh, the rest of the country and the general public um, at the beginning of the summer. Uh, Peacock, part of their original rollout proposition uh, for the general public in July was uh, timing around the Olympics. And we'll talk about the Olympics in a little bit, but of course the Olympics are not happening right now. So it somewhat changes the calculus for Peacock um, and what their core value proposition will be. Uh, luckily for them, the other side of that coin, the other thing that they are, uh, they're, they're, they're their selling point that they're focusing on 
is uh, classic comfort food television and classic sitcoms. Um, so that obviously is still there. And actually, as, as I just said, we're seeing an increase in demand for that kind of content. So that might actually bode well for them. Uh, the other thing to note about Peacock is when it, it when it does launch in July to the, to the general public, there will be a free ad supported tier. Um, and that could be crucial uh, to ex securing a larger audience. It seems like good timing for that, um, because if you can watch some of your favorite sitcoms with uh, for free with ads, uh, we might see a lot of people turning to that as a source of comfort in these difficult times. Um, and then lastly, HBO Max coming uh, this summer as well. Um, Whereas Peacock, I think, will be well positioned because of its free ad-supported tier, um, HBO Max uh, will be will have a challenge. I think uh, entering the market at their premium price point of fifteen dollars. HBO, obviously, and Warner Media, of course, has a ton of great content that will be on HBO Max. Uh, but the the question here is, if we do come out of this pandemic into a recession, um, fifteen dollars will start to look uh, very expensive in the streaming landscape, especially as there are plenty of other options uh, for less money. So that's uh, a look at those uh, three new and upcoming entrants into the streaming market. Um, we'll get into some more detail about gaming later, but in general, gaming has also been way up um, over the course of the pandemic. Um, Verizon is reporting a 75% increase uh, in the US, um, which is pretty much on par with uh, what we have, what we saw in China, where it settled at about 80% above normal levels. Um, we're still seeing that uh, amount of gaming traffic maintain. Um, so again, it's not quite double what it normally is, um, but it is up pretty close to that to that number. In terms of audio, uh, the numbers are um, a little bit lower, uh, but not perhaps as low as we might have feared. Um, we know that people consume audio content. Um, a lot of audio content is consumed on the commute. And obviously there are not that many people commuting right now. Of course, there are still some essential workers still uh, are commuting to, to their jobs. Um, and there is the question of audio in the home. Um, according to our, our research, lots of people do consume a lot of audio content in the home. Um, and that obviously might be up uh, because of people staying at home. But overall, um, audio it has slumped a little bit. Um, it's not terrible, but it is down a little bit. Radio consumption for terrestrial and satellite is down 16.6%. Podcast listening is down about 10%. Um, and the numbers for streaming music are sort of all over the board. Um, but in general, it does look like audio as a whole has slumped in that 10 to 10 to 15% range. Um, we expect that this is purely temporary. We don't expect this to permanently change um, any, use, any user behaviors and consumption of audio in the long term. Uh, I think as soon as people are, go back to commuting, these numbers will recover pretty, pretty nicely. <coughs> Um, and then, of course, from a media uh, landscape, um, the rise of uh, video conferencing um, and uh, uh, the that we're doing on those platforms um, has uh, shot up dramatically. Um, you might have seen uh, a stat, but uh, Zoom, which has been the biggest beneficiary of this um, at the outstart, they started with about 10, 10 to 20 million uh, daily active users before the pandemic and immediately shot up to 200 million daily active users. So a literal 10 to 20 X uh, what their normal level. Although Zoom was the early breakout star, um, more recently what we've seen is a huge uptick in uh, usage and downloads for House Party, um, which uh, to us and to our research indicates that uh, consumers after looking at Zoom are actually looking for a separation in their video conferencing and in their digital lives between work and socializing. Now that work and socializing both sort of happen remotely over video, um, people are looking to a different experience, maybe a more casual experience um, and definitely a different app so that uh, talking to your friends and talking to your coworkers and your clients, so it starts to feel different. So um, Zoom and Microsoft Teams very up on the work side and more recently house parties surging on the social side of things. So I'll pause there before I jump into the next section. Then were there questions? Yeah, we actually did have one. Um, do you mind clarifying the audio story, the impact of COVID on terrestrial radio versus streaming audio? <clears throat> um, yeah, so the uh, uh, the streaming audio landscape obviously is a little different than uh, terrestrial radio because 
Um, it, it, it's segmented between podcast streaming music and then there is streaming radio like Pandora or um, radio stations on Spotify or Apple Music. Um, this number, 16.6%, is terrestrial and satellite. It, it is traditional radio. It is uh, linear audio. It is not um, online digital audio. Um, so again, and these are the numbers we have right now. Um, radio consumption, terrestrial and, and uh, satellite down 16.6. Podcast listening is down 10% overall. Um, and again, unfortunately, the, the numbers that we have for um, streaming music are kind of all over the place, but uh, I think the safest assumption would be that it's up, down about the same percentage um, as, uh, as podcast and, and radio consumption. I would say, a, <clears throat> I would say saying it down 10 to 15 percent is pretty safe. But again, we, we expect this to be temporary. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, one more. Yep, one more quick one. Um, obviously, there's been some news lately about privacy concerns in Zoom. Um, how do you think, uh, do you think that there is a, a legitimate concern amongst uh, users as opposed to uh, corporations when it comes to using Zoom to connect with people? Yeah, that's a good. It's a good question. Um, uh, I'm sure people have seen a lot of headlines about it. Zoom has actually moved very quickly to address these concerns, which I think uh, obviously is the correct thing to do. They've stopped um, all development development and anything that's not security related. Certainly for personal usage, um, I don't think a lot of consumers are really worried about some of the concerns that uh, businesses and governments uh, had um, around Zoom. The biggest issue for personal uses uh, was the Zoom bombing where, where people were able to jump into meetings um, without being invited. They fixed that very quickly. Meetings all default to having uh, a password now. Um, so it's much harder to jump into a random strangers meeting. That was a concern, I think, um, on the side of, of a lot of schools who started using Zoom um, and maybe some individuals. Um, <clears throat> on the government and business side, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of work still to be done to make Zoom more secure. There are more secure options out there. So um, that's why we have seen some governments and some businesses switching to requiring members to use Microsoft Teams, which is inherently a bit more secure than Zoom. Oh, in the long run, though, there's no doubt that even if Zoom loses some customers out of that 200 million that they had immediately after the pandemic hit, um, they are going to be a much bigger company at the end of this than they were when they started. So they can afford to lose uh, a few million <laughs> out of that 200 million, and they're still going to be, uh, I think, very prominent in the marketplace. Um, and I think that as they continue to make security improvements, they will eventually win back some of those users. Great, thank you. Awesome. So um, jumping into this first section about um, what's happen happening uh, with theatrical and with cinemas. Obviously, movie theaters everywhere are, uh, for the most part, closed. Um, but I want to take a look at what is happening, the, the sort of ripple effects that are happening on, on Hollywood. Now, before we jump into that, uh, bef at the, 2020 was always going to be a more difficult box office year than 2019, no matter what. In the best of circumstances, it was going to be a more challenging year. Um, we didn't have uh, an Avengers movie. Uh, we didn't have uh, The Lion King. Uh, there were a lot of big tent poles, um, many of them from... Uh, a company named Disney um, that were also frozen too, that were propping up box office from 2019, um, making sure that 2019 was going to be a huge year. 2020 was always going to be a smaller year uh, because there were fewer tent poles in the pipeline um, and also less known franchises uh, among those tent poles. So, <clears throat> but even before we went into lockdown, um, the box office had started to slump um, as consumers, I think, started to see the news. We started to see companies like Google closing their offices. Um, a week or two before a lot of cities went into lockdown. I think some consumers who were very informed were seeing that news <clears throat> and opting to avoid going to public places. Um, so, uh, you know, the box office was already moving that direction. The most the immediate thing that happened was the delay of the release um, of a bunch of major temples from uh, the spring and pushing them back into the fall and some of them into 2021. Um, the strategies here were a little different. Um, with Bonds, they just copy and pasted it a year later. Um, Mulan uh, and Disney, what Disney basically did with their slate is they basically removed uh, a bunch of 
uh, tentpole release weekends and then slid everything back uh, in, into uh, the, the late summer and fall, um, which then of course had a ripple effect and pushed some things further into 2021. And in some cases, some of those 2021 releases rippled and pushed some things even later into 2022. Uh, so uh, at, at a large, in a large way, um, Hollywood in terms of box office is uh, is writing off 2020 um, as uh, an option for most major tentpoles. We will see some tentpoles come out in the fall, and the concern right now is that the fall is going to be very crowded. Um, and uh, so even even tentpoles that are released in the fall um, might face more competition against other tentpoles uh, and might sort of fracture the consumer base. Eight make these films not perform as well as they had if they had been released on, on the schedule that they were originally set for. <clears throat> the other uh, interesting impact um, is, um, and again, thinking of the pandemic as a trend accelerator, is that uh, release windows have been thrown into chaos. Um, and the traditional windowing system is uh, basically up for grabs. <laughs> with movie theaters closed, um, the, the studios are experimenting with lots of different release strategies. Um, Universal was uh, a first mover where they had um, three films, The Hunt, The Invisible Man, and Emma, which were in theaters when uh, the cinema started closing. Um, they put those immediately into a premium video on demand window um, where uh, they were still playing in the theaters that were open, but you could also rent them for $20 for a rental on uh, video on demand platforms such as iTunes and Amazon. Um, they, Trolls World Tour um, was a film that was supposed to come out uh, originally, as you can see on the poster this week, this Friday. Um, they actually released it, moved the release date up to last Friday, and they went straight to this premium video on demand window for a $20 rental. Um, Universal is claiming that Trolls World Tour had the biggest digital ever ever release, uh, being the number one rental across Apple, Amazon, Comcast, Vudu, uh, YouTube, DirecTV, and Fandango. Um, there's no way to, to verify that uh, other than uh, the fact that we've seen the numbers. We don't know how many people that means actually purchased that rental, um, but you know they're claiming claiming it as a win. I think it's safe to say it was as successful as it possibly could be. <clears throat> it's interesting because this premium video on demand window is again something that's been in discussion for years in Hollywood, um, originally at a much higher price point in the $40 to $50 range uh, for a movie that was still in theaters. Um, at this point, Universal went hard at $20. Uh, it'll be difficult to convince consumers uh, going forward uh, that a $50 rental is really worth it when we've seen Universal have success at the $20 range. Um, and uh, this is again, it's as a trend accelerator, we were expecting premium video on demand to uh, come to the market sometime in the next three to five years. Well, it's here now because right now it's the best option for, it's one of the best options uh, for movies uh, be, for, for movies being released. Um, Paramount took uh, a little bit of a different track um, and they went straight to streaming services uh, to SVOD services um, and sold uh, Lovebirds to Netflix and Big Time Adolescents to Hulu. Um, as we'll, we'll get into some of the the the, uh, the details around uh, production delays, but production is basically stopped uh, everywhere. Um, and as the streamers look to keep their catalogs fresh, um, they are buying up films that are, that are are available. So um, there, you know, we don't have the financial details on these transactions, but suffice it to say that it probably was uh, the, you know, a, a decent showing for Paramount going direct to SVOD with those. Um, Disney moved, uh, basically collapsed their windows um, for uh, Rise of Skywalker, Frozen 2, and Onward, um, where they moved them. They still went through the traditional windows, um, but they moved them through the windows very quickly. So Onward, for example, went to uh, a tr to um, digital video on demand services for just one week before it was put pushed to Disney Plus. Um, the other thing that they did is Artemis Fowl, which is somewhat of a tentpole, a, a debatable tentpole for Disney, but uh, one of their bigger movies that was to be released in May, um, that is going straight to Disney Plus without going through the the uh, the um, VOD services. Um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire was was a very uh, breakout independent hit. Um, especially uh, at award shows uh, last year, um, that went straight to Hulu, um, and Warner Brothers pushed, uh, moved 
birds of prey up and into the VOD window sooner to sort of maximize, ride the wave of their, their marketing um, on the film and theaters and, and um, push it straight to uh, VOD earlier. <clears throat> um, an interesting thing, uh, speaking of cinemas and what they could be doing in, in the pandemic, one interesting thing is that there is a coalition of um, of several independent movie theaters. Uh, the largest of them is Alamo Draft House, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, they have formed a coalition that has started buying up the rights to independent films uh, from directly from producers to rent them online in a premium view. You know. Uh, for 12 movies um, with lesser promotion behind them, but it does obviously provide some some line of business and some revenue uh, for these theaters while they're closed. And it's interesting because you actually, even Alamo, who has dozens of locations, you have to choose a specific, uh, your local theater um, is the one who actually is uh, recognizing the revenue from these rentals. So interesting, interesting approach there. Um, another shift that happened, and I think an interesting strategic move from Amazon, um, Amazon is offering uh, to host any film that was part of the South by Southwest Film Festival, which obviously was also canceled. Amazon has offered to those producers to uh, host their films on Prime Video, um, which would be available to any Prime subscriber for free for 10 days uh, later this month, later at the end of April. Um, so this is not compulsory. It's not uh, an automatic port of the South by Southwest Film Festival, um, but it is something that Amazon is negotiating with those, uh, those producers. Again, anybody with an existing SVOD service is really just hungry for content right now as they look to fill their pipeline. Um, I think a noteworthy thing and a thing we're doing with a lot of these reports is looking at what's happening in China as they're coming out the other side of this crisis. Um, and in China, the uh, movie theaters had started to open again, um, but they were only open for a week before being closed. On the surface, the excuse was for this was that they were, they did start to see a minor uptick in infections again. Uh, it turns out probably what's happening is uh, that basically no one was going. The movie movie theaters were uh, were not seeing attendance. Um, it does seem like in China, despite the lifting of social distancing rules, consumers are reluctant to um, go to crowded places uh, again. Um, and this might be the kind of thing that we will see uh, come out um, in the US as well. Um, eventually. It is something we're watching pretty closely. It does seem likely that at least there will be some reluctance to go to crowded places again, which could have a longer impact on theaters, even once they are allowed to open again. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, one thing I wanted to call out in this section is um, there was a very odd press release from uh, the Academy a couple of weeks ago um, saying that they are evaluating quote unquote all aspects of the coronavirus impact uh, for the Oscars. The speculation in the industry here is that for this year, for 2020, that they will drop the requirement that a movie must play in theaters in order to be eligible for Oscars. Um, this seems very likely given, given the current uh, circumstances. Um, but I think the more important point here is that if they do that, I think it's gonna be very hard to get the genie back in the bottle and that we will see that requirement dropped on a more permanent basis, even once theaters are allowed to reopen. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, any questions on that section? Yes, what is your review for Trolls World Tour? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we do not have any questions right now. <laughs> All right, I have not seen Trolls World Tour. Um, I can say The Invisible Man was great. Um, and I was super happy to watch it uh, at home on my couch. Um, I did just buy so some time to allow one section. question to come in, though. Oh, great. Sorry. Um, do you think we'll get more cinemas offering premium cinema experiences to overcome the fear of being too close to others when things open up again? So premium, i.e. spacious, the kind of places where you have an open, a, a bar, restaurant service, like the Alamo Draft House type experience that you referred to before? Yeah, I think that, um, look, this is going to have a permanent impact on the theatrical industry no matter what. Um, I think that uh, we will, in the short term, see theaters reopen, but limit their tickets to a half or a third of what they normally would be in order to uh, let people sit, you know, far enough apart that they feel secure. Um, but longer term, I do think that we will see 
uh, things uh, that are spaces that are more designed for that from the ground up. We might even see um, a rise of something that is, is popular in parts of Asia, which are sort of private screening rooms that are available for rent. So it's there's maybe 20 seats or, or 30 seats in a the theater um, that you rent out with your friends. Uh, for a screening, um, and they're, they, you know, they, they have a library of current films in theaters that you can choose from. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation. Um, the other thing that I, I uh, didn't mention, but that I think is noteworthy on this side of things, is uh, the Paramount decrees, which are the 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 legal rulings in the U.S. that prevent uh, studios from owning movie theaters, um, from those being owned by the same. I, I, I those have been indicated by the government that they are willing to let that go even before uh, the pandemic uh, happens. And with movie theaters so squeezed for revenue uh, during this year, um, if there are studios that are are feeling comfortable with their balance sheet, uh, we might see some studios and movie theaters start to merge. Um, and that could, I think, open up all kinds of other additional experiences and something that is much more experiential and high end uh, to the point of the, the person asking the question. Um, so lots of, lots of stuff there. You know, I think uh, until we are allowed to stop social distancing, uh, we won't really know uh, because we don't know how bad it's going to be for theaters uh, until that happens. And then, of course, like I said, even after that, we might not uh, be going to the movies so often. So, um, you know, I think the the theatrical window is is up for grabs, but I do think that that always opens up space for innovation. And if somebody comes, you know, this year, later this year, next year with a rethought from the ground up theatrical experience, I think that could uh, really innovate what's happening in Hollywood. Cool, those private screening okay. rooms sound awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, the next section is on what's happening in, in live content. Um, and the most important thing here for obvious reasons is the cancellation of uh, pretty much every kind of sporting event. Um, so, you know, I think this happened, uh, this happened both quickly and slowly. Um, the, the NBA uh, shutting down was actually, I think, the tipping point for a lot of Americans in recognizing the severity of what was to come. Um, but, uh, you know, pretty quickly, everybody else followed in their footsteps. There was a period where they were uh, trying to play games um, without a, a live audience. And as dystopian and strange as that might seem, it seems likely that that's, that is actually how sports will will return uh, to the media ecosystem. As you can see from the, the numbers uh, on the slide, um, from recent polling, the vast majority of Americans will not feel comfortable going to a live sporting event until we have a vaccine, which is likely 18 months away. Um, but uh, most of them are also willing to watch broadcasts without a live audience. Um, so it does seem like later this summer into the early fall, we might start to see games played um, without a live audience, but at least that helps them get back their TV viewership. Um, and of course, that's uh, sort of very critical um, to maintaining the uh, the leagues as uh, as businesses. Um, the other major thing, which I mentioned before, of course, is that the uh, Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics, um, have been postponed until summer of 2021. Um, you know, this they were again sort of dragging their feet and a little reluctant to do this to do this at first. Uh, but I think it was actually, uh, you know, a smart move. 2021, by the summer of 2021, um, we will have a much clearer sense as to how to manage giant events like this. Um, and hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, we will still be able to have an event like like the Olympics with a live audience uh, by summer of 2021. So how are how are networks and, and fans uh, dealing with this? Well, I think one of the, the earliest uh, pivots here was from ESPN, who uh, they brought back um, this concept called the Ocho, um, which is uh, they on, on Sunday, March 22nd, they turned one of their um, secondary ESPN networks in, uh, into the Ocho, which specializes in uh, obscure sports um, and hobbies that look like sports, even if you might not think about them as sports. So this is what you're looking at here is marble racing. Also things like stone skipping and, and sign spinning. Um, this is something that they'd done before. They'd done a few times since 2017. And it was an easy way for them to, you know, fill that content with something that approximates the experience of watching live sports. <clears throat> but um, really the, the, up, the uptake in uh, the replacing live sports has been around esports. Um, the shifts to, uh, to moving esports online 
um, was not maybe as obvious as it as you, you might have thought. Um, in that um, all of the major esports leagues uh, normally play in arenas um, with the teams uh, and players all in one place. Um, and so pivoting online seems like an obvious thing when you're playing on a computer or on a console, um, but it's actually a little more difficult normally because uh, there are concerns around things like bandwidth and latency that actually can come into play when you are a professional esports player. Those things can be important to your performance. Um, so normally these leagues like to, like to play all in person, um, but obviously given the circumstances, it's way easier for them to continue to, to play, um, play online. Um, and they've moved, uh, after some hesitation, uh, a, a lot of these events moved online. Um, and a lot of them um, have, uh, in the process of that, actually started changing their, their distribution deals. So whereas a lot of this might normally uh, just be streamed on Twitch, um, they've started to uh, increase their deals for uh, broadcast and network distribution um, to reach a wider audience as those networks are, are dealing with, uh, the, of course, the lack of live traditional sports. The other interesting thing that we're seeing is athletes from traditional sports moving into esports. So um, the, uh, uh, there are um, soccer players in Spain from playing in, in FIFA. Um, the uh, NBA, again, sort of at, at the lead of a lot of these trends. Um, they um, have moved a lot of matches uh, into exhibition matches inside of NBA 2K, um, which is their, their uh, the video, video game version. Um, and then uh, most successfully so far um, has been NASCAR iRacing. So that's there on the right. If you can't see, uh, if you can't see in detail, that's actually a, a, a video game, uh, not real cars racing. Um, so NASCAR iRacing um, has been uh, moved to Fox Sports 1. Um, and these are real professional racers who are using their simulation rigs that, that many of them already had at home with a real pedal and, and, and real steering wheels um, that allow them to actually race uh, virtually. So it's actually the closest, a much more close, much closer to the actual experience of racing um, than, you know, say playing NBA 2K, um, where you're just using a controller. In this case, they're at least using the same sort of interfaces uh, for, for racing. Um, that has been moved to Fox Sports 1, and it was uh, one of their top uh, air, uh, one of their top watched telecasts for the month of March. Um, so we, we are seeing an increased sort of viewership um, in esports, uh, bringing this to new audiences who are um, who are looking for sports like content. And again, clearly the the uh, iRacing is very close to the same kind of brand they would be watching normally. Um, but we see this as, a, as an opportunity to open up esports to new kinds of uh, audiences who might be looking for sports content. Um, cable news, uh, news in general, that is the other kind of content that has been uh, increased um, with, uh, as, this, as the stat says, it's up 72% across the board. Um, and again, we are seeing this heavily in uh, linear TV consumption, but also in, in streaming as well. An interesting side effect is that we are actually starting to see new kinds of content uh, become available for at-home viewing um, that never would have been available otherwise. We're seeing um, a lot of theater companies start to release archival recordings of their productions, streaming them online, sometimes for, for a fee, sometimes for free, um, as a way to, to engage their audience and have some revenue coming in, obviously when no one's going to the theater. Um, the Seattle Symphony was very quickly jumped on board um, and started, um, while they were still allowed to gather in smaller numbers, they actually were gathering to perform together um, and stream that live, uh, live to audiences at home. So have shifted to uh, archival recordings as well, since they're, of course, not allowed to gather anymore. Um, and the Metropolitan Opera um, has uh, been streaming uh, archival recordings of their operas, which are usually not available to the public, um, but you know, as a way to keep people engaged and maybe bring in new fans uh, of, uh, of opera who might at some point down the line purchase a ticket. I think the big question here is um, now that we have done this, um, will consumers expect this access to these kind of fine arts uh, performances that are usually only available in person? Um, and I do think that, um, you know, I'm optimistic that we will figure out some of the challenges around um, rights and unions that make airing some of these things normally uh, off limits, and that, that these arts organizations will start to figure out business models that make sense for them um, to, for, to be able to reach consumers uh, when they're at home and not able to be there in person. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, I, we are seeing an increased uh, percentage of, of um, consumers interested in sort of creating live events around on-demand content. So an early example of this um, from late March was uh, Playbill Magazine, uh, which is obviously uh, for uh, the, uh, the magazine that you get as a program as part of going to a Broadway play. Um, with Broadway shut down um, in mid-March, uh, they were trying to figure out what Playbill could be doing to engage with theater fans. So they actually were um, they, they were programming the uh, TV show Smash, which was has been off the air for a few years, but a rewatch of the two seasons of Smash um, with one episode every night and fans on Twitter sort of live tweeting along with the show. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more of this community building around um, on-demand content as a way to kind of eventize uh, that content and make it more of a live experience, even if the content itself is available for viewing at any time. Part of the, the benefit is the community and uh, watching along with other people remotely while you're um, watching that content. So I'll pause there. Uh, any questions? No questions at the moment. All right. I'll keep going. So uh, as I said earlier, gaming, uh, minutes spent gaming um, and time spent gaming has been increasing. Um, I think part of this is uh, because of gaming as a social space. People are looking, obviously, to connect with their friends and family members uh, while they are all stuck at home. Uh, but uh, after the first week or so, just having a drink on Zoom or uh, just having a FaceTime call um, you know, the only thing to talk about is the pandemic, really. And I think after the first couple of weeks, people are looking for other things to to do and to, ways to socialize that does, don't involve um, just staring at a, at a video call for, for an hour or so. Um, and that has been partially responsible for the huge uptick in gaming is use, the use of gaming um, as a social space. It's kind of the opposite of uh, the summer from a few years ago when Pokemon Go came out where everyone was socializing with each other, playing Pokemon Go out, outside, out in public, out in parks. Um, and uh, we're, we are kind of having the opposite experience at this at this moment, where we're using the, the game, games to connect with people virtually rather than in real life. And actually, Pokemon Go, which is still pretty popular, they, I think they have about 65 million monthly active users, um, they have updated the game to allow you to keep playing while you're still at home, of course, uh, because they want to keep, uh, keep people home um, but allow them to keep engaging with the game. The real breakout game of the moment is Animal Crossing New Horizons, which was released uh, just a week or two into lockdown here in the US. Um, Animal Crossing has been breaking record sales records around the world, um, and uh, it has been so popular that it's, it's driven new sales of Nintendo's Switch console, um, which to, to the point where in the US it's pretty much impossible to get a Switch at this point because so many people are buying them to play Animal Crossing. It's kind of the perfect game for the moment because it uh, rewards you for doing, for, for daily habits, uh, for doing things like meeting up with your neighbors, decorating your house, going fishing, um, and encouraging you and rewarding you for doing those things every single day. So it's kind of creating a virtual routine uh, for a lot of people that is in this you know weird time, very comforting. Um, and it reward, it's very generous with, with its rewards. Um, which is also obviously comforting uh, in, in this time. Um, and of course, it's also social. So you can go and visit your friends' islands um, and trade with your friends uh, and go and see how they're decorating their islands and their, their home. Very low stress, high reward game. Um, and that social element, again, gives you uh, a way to connect with people, uh, with your friends and family um, without, you know, needing, without a lot of effort. Um, interestingly, Animal Crossing is a creative element where user, users can design their own designs and their own clothing to be used in their homes or to dress their characters. And we have seen a couple of um, brands uh, actually uh, start to create that, uh, leverage that ability to reach consumers in the game. Um, 100 Thieves, which is uh, an esports team that also uh, has a, an extensive line of uh, very fashion forward streetwear. Um, they recreated all of their uh, merchandise and all, all of their, their clothing in Animal Crossing um, and made that available for players to import uh, into, their, into their game and to dress their characters in. 
And the Cincinnati Museum um, recreated uh, about a dozen uh, pieces of art that are hanging in the Cincinnati Museum, Cincinnati Art Museum, sorry, um, that uh, players are able to import and use to decorate their homes in Animal Crossing. So you might not be able to have um, a, uh, a famous painting at home, but you can have one in your home in Animal Crossing. <coughs> Um, another breakout game uh, that has been very popular during lockdown is uh, Doom Eternal. Um, it uh, has been seeing uh, regularly 100,000 uh, concurrent players uh, on Steam um, and has been uh, basically doubled the release of the last game in the Doom series from 2016, doubled the amount of revenue and the number of players uh, who have purchased, purchased the game. Just another big release I wanted to call out. Um, I think, you know, there's there's the other reason that things like Animal Crossing are so popular is because they are kid friendly. And again, parents are looking for things uh, for their kids to do while they're stuck at home. And, uh, you know, obviously, as much as possible, they would love those things to be creative and educational. Um, so Minecraft, which uh, is a sort of creative play game and a, a game based on creativity, um, they uh, have always had uh, curriculum designs to be used in the classroom. Um, and because of the pandemic, they've actually made several of those lesson plans available for free for parents to use at home with their kids. We have seen an explosion of parents and kids playing together inside of Minecraft, sometimes for the first time, as parents look for ways to engage with their kids in new ways, look to learn more about the kinds of, of games and, and toys that their kids are, are, are interested in. Um, and I think that this could start to shift some assumptions some traditional assumptions that some parents might have about the educational value of gaming as they see things like Minecraft uh, actually release things like curriculum. Um, just calling back to uh, what we what we saw happening in China for a mobile stat, mobile gaming is also up just because people are home uh, doesn't mean they're not using their mobile devices. Um, Mobile gaming is not up quite as much as console and PC gaming. It was up 27.5% in China. We're seeing numbers uh, about the same in the US in the 25 to 30% range. Um, and um, yeah, so just, you know, just another another platform, another way to reach people. Even though when they have other options, people are still using their phones uh, because you know sometimes just because you have your phone on, on the couch doesn't mean you're going to get up to walk that, that whole five feet over to your computer if you want to play a game. Um, the other side of things is the game streaming um, and uh, street on, on sites like Twitch and YouTube gaming um, has taken off. Um, it has, uh, this is from early on in the pandemic, so the U.S. number it has been uh, much higher recently. Um, but the number of users who are, are using this time to explore streaming as an, as an out, uh, excuse me, to ex who are exploring streaming as an outlet uh, because they do have more time at home, because they are gaining more. Um, they, we are, have seen um, streaming hardware, the hardware necessary to stream these games, uh, has been selling out at retailers as more people look to take this opportunity to experiment with it. Um, again, this and we are seeing more a higher viewership as well. So again, I think this is something that accelerated a trend. It basically brought a lot more people into the fold, both as producers and as, as consumers on the game streaming side of things. Um, one thing that, that has been on the mind of a lot of people in the gaming community is the upcoming releases of the PlayStation 5 uh, and the Xbox Series X, um, which are both slated for holiday of this year. Um, it was expected to be a big year for gaming because of the release of these two devices. Um, both, both companies are saying that, that the consoles will be still be, be released for the holidays, but there is some speculation that supplies will be very much constrained uh, because of troubles with the production lines. Um, we still don't entirely know. I think it's still too early to know for sure. Um, but uh, it could this who wins the next console race could very well turn out to be which between Sony and Microsoft, who has the better supply chain, who can be more nimble and respond more and rebound more quickly after this uh, to get enough consoles into into stores and to, into consumers' hands this holiday season. Any questions on on gaming? Hey Adam, so you discussed about, you, you talked about an increase of streaming and people paying attention to live stream. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, diversity of content 
that we're now seeing streamed outside of gaming? Yes, so there had been a trend, I'd say for the past year or so, um, you know, Twitch especially had been looking to diversify outside of just gaming for a while. Gaming is a huge audience for them and obviously the bulk of their business. Um, but I think there's, all, they, they see a lot more potential for live streaming as a platform um, in general. And we have seen uh, an increase in the number of people even before the pandemic who were um, do in channels like just chatting, um, which is really just uh, a place for people to live stream their conversations. Um, and I, I think that we, ha we ha I don't know, I haven't seen hard numbers on it, but anecdotally, it does seem like, uh, again, people are taking this time at home to be creative. We have seen an explosion in, on, in, in people on TikTok who are creating content. Um, the consumption levels are, I think, are, are, are on a slower trend than they were as they were before. The creative creation has gone up. Um, it's got up on Twitch. Uh, I will insert a minor plug for uh, the lab has been holding um, office hours with uh, with uh, our partners, uh, our um, startup partners who uh, work uh, in the media innovation business. We've been holding office hours Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Twitch. Um, so. Uh, We've been experimenting with that, but I think we're we're riding a trend um, that has been expanding the sort of creative options for consumers who are stuck at home right now. Cool, thank you. So um, I alluded to this before, but an important component of what's happening in Hollywood right now um, is that uh, production of Pretty much all content uh, across the board from every every arm <laughs> of every production of every studio um, has been halted, uh, obviously, for the, because of the need to socially distance. Um, the one exception to that is uh, animation. So um, even though most of the time animation does happen in a centralized location, um, because it's all digitized and I'm done by computer at this point, um, they um, a lot of animation studios were able to pivot uh, to at working at home. So uh, things like The Simpsons, Family Guy, uh, and Bob's Burgers, those are all still in production. And I think that going into this fall, we are very likely to see uh, an explosion of new animated content uh, because that is one of the few things that can still sort of stay in production while we are all socially distancing. I mean, even, even into the future, we might see animation become uh, a larger force in Hollywood um, as a sort of just in case we ever have uh, to go into a lockdown situation again, we know it can it can continue production. Um, you know, one of the first pivots uh, was around uh, news shows and, uh, and and game shows and late night television and those those kinds of shows that normally have a live studio studio audience. Uh, for a while, there was an awkward moment where they were were doing it without the audience, but still had the host there. Um, and then pretty quickly, that also was shut down um, and pivoted into. Um, into, into production remotely from home. Um, and there were some awkward moments and a lot of different uh, approaches to how to do this. Some of you might have seen last week's uh, Saturday Night Live, which was all done uh, on Zoom uh, with uh, all of the performers at home. Um, I think it, the, the interesting angle here for me is um, that we're seeing professionals in Hollywood have to learn to use the same tools um, and, and, and software as uh, as uh, podcast producers, as YouTube stars, um, the kinds of things that, um, you know, people, quote unquote, who have built up careers around generating content on the internet have known how to do these things for years. And a lot of their content content actually looks better and is more polished than things coming from, from professionals in Hollywood who are suddenly having to learn entirely new processes and entirely new tools for production. Um, I think that this is also, I think that that is, that is a trend that was going to happen. We were going to see Hollywood and YouTube and podcasting kind of all converge uh, on, on each other. But of course, because of the pandemic, that was pulled forward, forward also. Um, and the question, the lingering question here is how much of this production goes back to the way it was versus how acceptable is it for, uh, for, to consumers uh, for you know professionally highly funded productions from Hollywood to look more like YouTube. I think there's going to be a lot more acceptance of that going forward. And I don't know that that, that that changes any of our existing shows, but I do think it changes the kind of shows that will be greenlit going forward, um, that Hollywood is now open to uh, shows that can be remotely produced. 
Um, and I think that changes access. It changes who gets their show, who gets shows greenlit. It changes the kinds of shows that are greenlit. It changes it changes the kinds of shows that are possible in the first place. So I do think this is going to have a lasting effect on the aesthetics of Hollywood, and because of the, the that shift in aesthetics, also the shift in the kind of content that's available. Um, we are already seeing um, some uh, shifts in reality television to shift to remote production. Uh, TLC has announced that uh, they're doing a spin-off of 90, 90 Day Fiance called 90 Day Fiance Self-Quarantined, um, where all of the couples are uh, sort of remotely quarantined, of course. Um, so this is actually, they're getting this out the door very quickly. It's premiering next week, April 20th, um, with more than 40 cast members, most of them returning from previous seasons. Um, and so far, only one scripted show um, has shifted to remote production. Um, CBS's freshman series, All Rise, uh, is going to produce one episode remotely using Zoom, FaceTime, uh, and social media. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what this looks like. I expect we are going to see um, a lot of things, uh, a lot of episodes and, and sort of bottle episodes of people in lockdown. Even once we go back to normal, normal production, this is something that is going to be uh, discussed and recognized in Hollywood for a long time. And then lastly, there is the question of the upfront. Um, and uh, there was a period where, a brief period, where a lot of um, content providers looked to pivot the upfronts to online presentations. Since that time, though, um, most of those have been canceled uh, because of the lingering production uh, halts. Uh, a lot of the, the pipeline for content is uncertain at this point, and I think that uh, no one's entirely sure when they will be able to hold upfronts, um, if they hold them at all. Just uh, over this past weekend, um, Bob Iger, who is the former CEO of Disney but still kind of running the show, said that uh, he thinks that Disney will probably, he's not committing 100%, but will probably not hold upfronts going forward. Um, so TBD, exactly what they do instead, uh, that's a very bold statement. Um, but again, this is accelerating trends. We knew the upfront process was getting a little um, out of touch with how the content providers wanted to work um, and, and also how brands wanted to work. So I think uh, we will see Hollywood totally rethink that process and how um, buying ads uh, on premium content is, is handled. So I, again, you know, Disney is in, a major leadership position in Hollywood. So I expect that uh, if they announce something in the near future, that a lot of other uh, providers will fall in line behind them. I'll pause there for a second. I know we're running a little late on time, but we will continue beyond the uh, one hour mark. Um, so, and if you have to go, we will, of course, this content is all available uh, for streaming and on demand um, as soon as this is over. No questions at the moment, so you can soldier on if you'd like. OK, great. So last section um, that we're, we're calling the age of anxiety. We have been tracking this trend, uh, the age of anxiety, uh, before the pandemic. Uh, it was part of our 2020 outlook um, that we published in January. And at that point, we were really thinking about consumers being overwhelmed by the amount of content that they have to consume and that they feel like they must consume. Um, we were, were thinking about things like privacy and uh, data retention, um, especially as we move into things like smart cities and, and connected cars uh, and, and more data about our activities being sort of watched by, by tech companies and governments. Um, and those things are still there, a little bit altered, uh, but they're still there. But right now, of course, the big anxiety um, it has been around the pandemic. Um, and so this is just a roundup of a few things that uh, some brands and media companies are doing to respond. Um, ABC was one of the fastest responders um, with uh, making sure that they were getting news information and, and reliable information to their viewers. Um, so they, they moved Nightline back to its original 11.35 p.m. slot um, and turned it into a single topic broadcast focused on coronavirus updates called COVID-19 outbreak. Um, and then they also replaced the third hour of Good Morning America um, with the uh, 2020 pandemic, what you need to know. So a full hour, both in late night and morning content uh, focused specifically on the pandemic to make sure that viewers were receiving accurate and updated information. 
Um, Hulu, which is of course owned now by ABC's parent company, Disney, um, they added ABC News um, to their on-demand Hulu service. Um, so uh, even if you didn't don't subscribe to Hulu with live TV, you can access ABC News, um, which is of course great for keeping those users uh, informed and also gives them a taste of the live TV product. So that again, possibly when sports comes back, uh, more users will be uh, will understand how Hulu with live TV works and we'll we'll be looking to them to get their sports content uh, later this year. <coughs> Um, Oprah, who has an overarching deal with Apple right now, um, she launched a, uh, a series called Oprah Talks COVID-19, um, which is free to view on Apple TV Plus, even if you're not a subscriber, um, and uh, is just conversations with her and people who are have been affected by COVID-19, starting with Idris Ella and his wife, uh, who were the first guests. Um, but as you can see uh, from the, the screenshot of the production values, she's literally just talking to people on FaceTime. Which is, of course, again, that pivots to uh, the production values and, and aesthetic uh, that I was talking about earlier. Um, one impact that a, a lot of people are concerned about, um, especially governments, uh, are is the impact of everybody staying at home streaming content. What is that doing to to our networks? Um, in Europe, uh, they the European Commission asked streaming services to reduce their bandwidth. Um, they did that in a variety of different ways um, to comply with that request. Um, we are seeing some of that happen in the U.S. as well, but the, the good news is that here in the U.S., uh, the bandwidth has not been a problem. Um, basically, our usage uh, in prime time has gone up a, a bit, about 25% uh, from where it was normally. But the, the, the larger trend is that that new peak level of streaming, it basically continues throughout, throughout the day. Um, day parts are pretty much gone. People are watching content constantly. But despite that, um, Comcast and Verizon have said that uh, their networks are fine. They're not worried um, about uh, about the bandwidth. So at least for now, uh, if our consumption doesn't increase too much more, uh, everything is good and we won't see um, reductions in things like video quality. Um, I mentioned, you know, a, a lot of brands are looking for uh, ways to engage with kids as a way to give some relief to their parents. Um, Amazon, across a lot of their properties, has released free content for kids. Um, they've got uh, on Prime Video, they have uh, made 40 of their shows free outside of the paywall. So even if you're not a Prime subscriber, you can watch those, those kids shows. They also added um, 80 family movies to their ad-supported IMDb TV service as well. Um, and then they also own Audible, the audiobook uh, company, um, and they made pretty much all of their audiobooks for kids free for the duration of school closures. And in what I think was a very inspired decision, um, uh, the Hallmark Channel, they uh, ran a Christmas movie marathon sort of counter here in March, counter-programming uh, news about the pandemic as a way to offer that sort of comfort food TV to their viewers. Um, it was incredibly successful for them. The first weekend, their 9 p.m. movie drew twice as many viewers as that as it normally would in that slot. Um, and because it was so successful, they have committed to uh, running these this Christmas movie marathon every weekend uh, during the lockdown. Um, because of the concerns around the production shutdown, um, Netflix has been using their uh, large uh, stash of cash to help alleviate some of those concerns and, and sort of bolster their image in Hollywood. Um, they're doing that in two ways. First is they committed to um, continue to pay the, the performers and the crew for productions that were shut down as if they were still um, in production. But on top of that, they also launched a $100 million fund to help uh, folks in Hollywood who are out of work because of the production shutdown. So Netflix has always had sort of a tenuous relationship with uh, old school traditional Hollywood, um, but at least right now because of these moves, um, they are sort of uh, winning over a lot of, uh, a lot of former critics. Um, and it's, it's an interesting time to see that transition happening while of course uh, streaming uh, is up. Um, and Netflix is providing a way for a lot of uh, content you get to consumers at this point. <clears throat> so looking at the next normal and what we think is going to come out of this um, on the other side. Um, first, 
definitely accelerated cord cutting. Um, and uh, the definitely as we see streaming and, and OTT consumption go up uh, way higher than, than linear television and due to, due to the lack of sports and due to economic pressures coming out of a, a probable recession, um, I think we will see a lot of people cutting their, canceling their cable um, to save money in the short term and then looking to VMPVDs like Hulu with live TV um, to get their sports content on the other side of this. We also are seeing increased spending on streaming services right now. That's sort of an, an obvious one because you're stuck at home. You're not spending money going out, spending another $10 or so on a, a new streaming service to have more content options seems like an obvious choice. I think this is going to reset the bar for what people are willing to spend on streaming services. And even after they, people start going back to work and start going out more, um, that a lot of that money will stay with those services. We're also seeing increased um, uh, increased attention on um, ad supported video on demand services. And that I think will also continue um, and will, will grow even more if we do come out of this into, into a recession as people are looking to broaden our entertainment options while limiting the amount of money that they're spending. Mentioned this in the beginning, but uh, windowing is broken right now, <laughs> our normal content windowing, um, and uh, it is likely to stay that way because we're unlikely to snap back to a world that is exactly the same as the one that we left. Uh, I think that windows are basically permanently up, up for negotiation, at least for the next few years. Um, and we're going to see a lot of studios and a lot of content producers get incredibly creative with how they move their content between different platforms. Um, and on the platform owner's side, who is sort of what, what the pecking order of different platforms is uh, in terms of where, where content goes first. Definitely increased viewership for esports. Um, as we said, uh, the lack of traditional sports is really bolstering that in the short term, but that is a viewership that we expect to continue, um, even when live sports does come back, because once you find out that you enjoy watching esports, uh, it's likely something that you will retain and continue to do. Um, definitely increased investment in animation in the short term, a lot of money pouring into animation to make sure that there is new, fresh content in the fall. Um, but uh, also, as I, as I mentioned, the sort of interest in new kinds of production and, and new techniques and new aesthetics. Um, I think Hollywood is going to get very creative with uh, the kinds of content that is considered premium um, and, and what that looks like and how that's produced. And then lastly, you know, demand for that escapist content, that comfort food television. Everybody uh, is looking for a little bit of relief uh, from uh, the current atmosphere. And we expect that that's going to continue for a good long time as uh, um, you know, a recession will will definitely increase that as well. Um, and, and just the the escapist nature of uh, people looking for something to do other than focus on the news and focus on uh, the difficult times that we're in right now. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you all for being here. Um, ben, any questions before I wrap things up quickly? Yep, we just had one come through. Uh, do you think that this general rate of trend acceleration and adoption will continue over to areas like AR and VR as a form of virtual connection or, or experience? Yeah, interesting. So um, I've been a, a, as bullish as I am on AR in the long run. I don't think that the current environment really accelerates AR adoption at all. Um, for VR, we have seen that a lot of VR headsets have been sold out at major retailers um, as well. Um, so I do think that it has accelerated adoption a bit for virtual reality, but I think the big problem with VR has always been not the hardware, but that the tools for virtual reality outside of gaming um, are just not there. Um, there's just not an, a well-designed, well-rounded, let's say virtual meeting space in VR. Um, if there was, that I think would be very popular right now, um, but there there really isn't. There really isn't like a Zoom equivalent for VR or a house party for VR. Um, Facebook is launching Facebook Horizon later this year. Theoretically, we, we haven't heard from them otherwise. That might have been uh, sort of the right kind of social thing that would have drove, driven even higher VR adoption right now. Um, but I think, I think it pulls it forward a little bit because again, a bunch of people did realized they were going to be stuck at home and thought now was the right time to uh, buy a VR headset and, and be able to spend some time with it. 
Um, but I don't think that it had a major impact. Um, even though they are sold out everywhere, production was not very high for most of those headsets. So it's not like we went from, you know, uh, 10 million headsets in market to 50 million headsets in market. We probably went from 10 or 15 million. We probably gained a couple of extra million uh, of, of headsets in market than we would have had otherwise. Anything else? That is it, but if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to us and we are happy to address those after the session. Yep, thank you all for attending. Um, this video, as soon as it's done encoding, will be available for sharing internally. Um, all of this content, as I said at the beginning, is available for presenting to your clients, for customizing to your clients. Uh, you can reach out to me, adam at ipglab.com uh, for any of that. You should also check out Floor 9, the Labs podcast, which has now gone weekly um, and is featuring industry leaders talking about how COVID is affecting their industry and their, their media and their marketing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the lab also has office hours at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Twitch, where you can see uh, our partnerships team, Scott and Ryan, uh, interview and, and hang out with uh, one of our startup partners in the media space. Uh, it's been a great time. Um, and uh, I think that's everything. So thanks again, and we hope to see you at some of the uh, other sessions we'll be having throughout this week. Thank you.